thank you. I love the term consilience, and I'm going to tell you today about the consilience between Himalayan mountain climbing and chemistry, and how that leads to wise public policy for a healthy world. Does that sound unlikely? <laughs> we will see. Well, my journey started in my freshman chemistry lab at Reed College. My professor, Jane Shell, was 23 and had a PhD in chemistry from MIT, which was pretty unusual in those days. There were four girls in my freshman chemistry class. We all got doctorates in chemistry. We were so inspired. And it says something about the importance of uh, role models. And my freshman chemistry lab partner was a very handsome young man who climbed mountains. So suddenly I was doing mountain climbing and chemistry. <laughs> and I kept happily doing mountain climbing and chemistry, doing reasonably well at both. When I was a grad student at Berkeley, I passed my qualifying exams. Several of my climbing partners were going off to climb Denali, the highest mountain in North America. And I climbed almost that high in the Andes. And um, I wrote for an application to go on the climb. And it said that women could go as far as base camp to help with the cooking. So I called and I said, well, I've actually climbed nearly as high as Denali in the Andes. And I'd really like to climb, not just cook. And they said, well, women are not physically strong enough or emotionally stable enough to climb mountains like Denali. So what did we do? This is the summit of Denali, the first. <laughs> This was the first all-women's ascent. And um, it turned out women were, were pretty good at climbing. <laughs> so around that time, um, someone told me about a flame retardant that was used in kids' pajamas called brominated tris. And they thought it was getting into the children, and it was a problem. And so we found a little girl who'd never worn uh, tris-treated pajamas, and we put her in the pajamas. Um, and the next day, we found tris breakdown products in her urine. So that meant the tris was going into the child from the pajamas. You know, it turns out that chemicals in our foods, drugs, and pesticides are all regulated, things that go into our mouths. But other chemicals, like in our pajamas, are not regulated at all. And they can end up inside us just the same way. So uh, we ran a screening test to see if this chemical, Tris, changed DNA. Was it a mutagen? Was it likely to cause cancer? And the answer, it was one of the strongest mutagens we'd ever seen. So we got very worried. And I thought, oh my goodness, we have to write a paper and tell everybody about this terrible mutagen that's in all the kids' pajamas in America. But then I got invited to climb this mountain. Does anybody know what mountain this is? It's Mount Everest. And at that point, no American woman had even had an opportunity to climb Mount Everest. And I got invited to teach chemistry at Wellesley College. So I had a terrible dilemma, and I'm going to ask you what you would do. You all get to vote once. The three choices are telling all the parents in America about the toxic flame returns in pajamas, going to climb Mount Everest, or going to teach chemistry at Wellesley College. So how many of you would tell the parents about the toxic pajamas? <laughs> OK. How many of you would go to Mount Everest? OK. And how many of you would go teach chemistry at Wellesley College? <laughs> So what did I do? All of them. All of them. <laughs> Wellesley very kindly gave me my first semester off, a leave of absence to go to Mount Everest. That was a nice thing to do. And while I was climbing uh, in the Kumbu Icefall on Everest and in the Great Western Kum, these gorgeous places, I would carry my loads all day, plodding up the mountain. And then I'd get to camp, and I'd busily write my paper. Um, here's my high point at 24-5 on Everest. And you notice my flag had two Petri dishes. The one with only two colonies was the one without tris, not many mut mutations. But the other one, it's kind of blowing the wind, was full of um, colonies, because that was the petri dish with the, with the tris on it. 
So this was the American Bicentennial Everest Expedition. Um, I didn't get to the top, but we did reach the summit October 1976 for the Bicentennial. And after this picture was taken, I sent my paper by mail runner to Kathmandu. <laughs> And then it went on to Berkeley, where it was published as a lead article in Science Magazine. And this paper is a little bit unusual, because the subtitle says a lot about what our institute does. So for those of you who read scientific papers, what do all papers end with as the recommendation for the next thing to do, always? What? More study. More study. And our paper says the main flame retardants in children's pajamas is a mutagen and should not be used. Do scientists do that very often? No, they do more science and more science, but they don't pause and use their science to make a difference for the public. And uh, the Green Science Policy Institute, which I founded, our goal is to encourage scientists globally to take their research and use it to make a difference. So we published this paper in January 1977. April 1977, Tris was banned from kids' pajamas. I don't know how many of you were kids then, but you only wore these pajamas for about a year. And that was because we actually made a statement. Now, unfortunately, when a chemical is banned, industry likes to keep their processes as similar as possible. So when um, brominated Tris was banned, what do you think the replacement was? chlorinated tris. So we ran more mutagenicity tests, and surprise, it was also a mutagen, looked like it caused cancer. It was also removed from kids' pajamas. However, the sad news is that chlorinated tris has been the major flame retardant used in furniture and baby products across America during the last decade. Used at 5% of the weight of the foam in our furniture, foam, and baby products, the same chlorinated tris. However, I didn't know that back in the 70s. And on my way back from Everest, I got a permit for this mountain, Annapurna. At that point, all the world's 8,000 meter peaks, that's 26,000 feet, it's a magic height for climbers. They'd all been climbed by men and not a single woman had climbed to 8,000 meters, and people believed that women were not strong enough to climb to 8,000 meters. Well, after Denali, I knew that women could. Um, I thought Annapurna was the first 8,000 meter peak ever climbed. It was climbed in 1950 by Maurice Herzog from France. I thought it was the first one climbed. It must be the easiest and the safest. So guess which 8,000 meter peak turns out to be the most dangerous? <laughs> Annapurna, and probably the hardest to climb. There was not enough history to do good research. So this is our team, and uh, we ranged in age from 20 to 50 in those days. We still get together, and we feel like we're back on the glacier. We're going to be getting together in a few months. And we climbed in very, very beautiful places, uh, very steep ice. The reason Annapurna is so dangerous is it's very high precipitation, and these huge avalanches come thundering down. Virtually every expedition loses someone. Even though this looks beautiful to me, once I became a mom, I don't go to places like this anymore. Not a good place for mothers to be. Um, but we reached the summit. We were the first women, the first Americans. We unfurled a flag along with the Save the Whales pin, and uh, we were very happy. Um, I wrote a book called Annapurna Woman's Place in about a year about the Annapurna climb. And then I thought, how did I ever get to Annapurna? I was raised by conservative Orthodox Jewish grandparents who would not let me go to the beach or ride horses because it was too dangerous. Yeah. And I thought, now, I'm kind of a, I had a really crazy childhood. So I thought, I'll spend another year and I'll write a book about how my crazy childhood led to my climbing Annapurna. So my next book took 20 years, like a big therapy project, Breaking Trail. Um, and meanwhile, in 1980, I had actually quit doing science. Um, the climate in our country in about 1980 became very unconducive for research on chemicals. Everyone I knew was losing their grants. I thought, I'll take a year and I'll walk across the Himalayas. And then I fell in love and had a family. And anyway, so now it's 2006. My daughter is starting college. I wanted her to go to a small liberal arts college, but she didn't. 
Well, she went to Stanford, but she was starting school, which wasn't far from home. We live in Berkeley. Um, but I realized, you know, I thought, I want to go back to science. And I hadn't done science for 26 years. And I thought, well, maybe I can get a job washing test tubes in a lab, you know. I just, but I really wanted to do science again. And um, so, the last, so this was like now eight years ago. And I just have to say, the last eight years has been like climbing Annapurna every day <laughs> and has been the biggest adventure of my life. And it's been about um, reducing toxic chemicals in the everyday products we use. But if I weren't a Himalayan mountain climber, I wouldn't have achieved any of, of none of the things would have happened. And so the problem, actually, I'm going to go and just ask, how many of you think if a product is in your toothpaste or your shampoo, someone in the government is making sure it's safe for you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Nobody thinks it's a very sophisticated, <laughs> a couple people, but a sophisticated audience. So the problem is we have one law in America about chemicals before they go out in the environment. Once they're out there, there's a Clean Air Act, a Clean Water Act, but once they're out there, you can't bring them back. It's called the Toxic Substances Control Act. It was passed in 1976. Uh, 62,000 chemicals were grandfathered. That means they're OK, and nothing can be done. Even asbestos, which kills 10,000 people a year, cannot be regulated. Now, we don't use asbestos, but that's because of lawsuits. And everyone who wins an asbestos lawsuit dies. That's not a good way to regulate chemicals. Uh, new chemicals, no information is required. Um, so I said I'm going to talk about flame returns. And you may be wondering why. Remember I said that that same tris that was removed from kids' pajamas is back in all of our furniture today? And the reason is, in California, we have a law called Technical Bulletin 117. And it says that the foam inside furniture won't burn when exposed to a small flame for 12 seconds. Now, if you do a thought experiment and drop a candle on your couch, what burns first? The fabric. And then do you have a small flame or a large flame? Large. And then the foam burns in two or three seconds and gives off lots more toxic gases. But this standard is all the furniture in California. And because manufacturers all kind of follow California, it's about, we did a paper recently looking at furniture across the United States. About 95% of the furniture across the US will have a label on it saying technical bulletin 117, go home and look at your couch. And it means that about 5% of the foam inside is a flame retardant. So the flame retardant that was used from 1975 to 2004 is called PENTA. Um, it's this, the top molecule up there is a PCB, polychlorinated biphenyl, causes cancer, lots of problems. Underneath is that flame retardant. And then if you add oxygen to the flame retardant, you get the third and fourth molecule, which are dioxins and furans, all highly toxic. And, um, the, that penta was used in all the furniture pretty much in the country, all in California and about two-thirds outside California uh, from 1975 to 2004 when it was globally banned, where 150 countries decided to ban it. There were only 22 chemicals that have been globally banned like that. And when it was banned, guess what the replacement was? Our old friend chlorinated Tris. So if your couch is before 2004, you have penta after chlorinated tris, very likely. And what are the health effects? They're long-term effects. So it's not like you get a rash. Um, there are things that happen in the future, endocrine disruption, neurodevelopmental problems, reproductive effects in males and females, immune suppression, and cancer. These are in animal studies. Um, the chemical industry does a lot to promote their chemicals, and they say it's not sound science, that there's no papers to show any harm. So we did a little study. There's 4,000 peer-reviewed papers. This is very well studied, but this information was never reaching the decision makers. Uh, there are human health effects, mostly if a pregnant woman has a high level during pregnancy. Uh, the brain development of the fetus is impacted so that the child uh, could have um, impaired attention, poor coordination, about four to six less IQ points. Uh, how do the chemicals get out? They're always coming out of the furniture, dropping into dust. Uh, you get some dust on your hand and you eat. Uh, cats have 10 to 100 times the level of people. Why would that be? They lick their fur, their grooming behavior. 
toddlers who crawl in the dust have three times the level of their parents because they get the penta through the placenta from breast milk and then from hand-to-mouth contact. And of course, young children would be the most vulnerable to the effects. Um, so wild animals at the top of the food chain, the chemicals go to the North and South Pole. 98% of penta was used in North America to meet our furniture standard, but you find it in polar bears, Tasmanian devils, all these top of the food chain predators. And of course, a nursing baby is at the top of the food chain. So that's my couch. I had very high levels of penta in my dust. Four years later, I got, after getting rid of my couch, the penta levels in my dust went from 97 parts per million to three parts per million. So getting rid of toxic couches is helpful. Um, we decided, you know, based on my experience in the 70s, where we wrote a paper and three months later a chemical was banned, we decided to do legislation in California. Everybody favored it. Firefighters, furniture industry, fabric industry, scientists, everybody said, we don't want these toxic chemicals, there's no benefit. But who did not support it? Citizens for Fire Safety. California's for Fire Safety. And those are the three companies, Albemarle, Chemtura, and Israel Chemicals Limited, who made the chemicals and made a lot of profit from them. Um, at the same time as we were struggling for six years to pass legislation, oh, and I should just go back and say this was part of a $6 million advertising campaign in one week when it looked like we were maybe going to be able to change to a standard with increased fire safety without toxic chemicals. Does this sound like climbing Annapurna and facing avalanches and storms and <laughs> you just have to keep plodding up the mountain? Um, there was $23 million documented spent against us in terms of trying to pass legislation in Sacramento. But at the same time, taking good science to decision makers, there was for sure going to be a small open flame standard for pillows, mattress pads, and bed coverings. We were able to prevent that from happening with good science. So taking that mountain of science to decision makers made the difference. Uh, there was going to be a standard that all the plastic around all the electronics in the world was going to have to meet a small open flame standard, an estimated 1.4 billion pounds more flame retardants. And, I have to say, how many of you uh, work on your computer by candlelight? <laughs> but nonetheless, the chemical industry makes a big profit from the flame retardants, and they had spent six years on this standard with secret votes in 40 countries. And we were able to get good science to all 40 countries. And that was harder than Annapurna, and we defeated the candle standard. This is a cover from Electronics Magazine. Everything changed when the Chicago Tribune wrote this uh, series, 20 front page stories. A deceptive campaign by industry brought toxic flame retardants into our homes and our bodies, and the chemicals don't even work as promised. Before this came out, I was like, it's a party. Someone asked me what I did, and I'd tell them the whole flame retardant story, and they'd all move away. <laughs> but uh, after this came out, um, Senator Durbin, the majority, majority whip in the Senate, was ranting, and Barbara Boxer was ranting, and it all changed. And uh, Governor Jerry Brown uh, directed California to change our standard, and it has changed. January 1st, the standard changed. It's a smolder standard for fabric where fires start. We have increased fire safety without flame retardants. All these baby products that used to be full of flame retardants have been exempted. And this is a huge change. And um, so for me, climbing mountains is really like doing chemistry. And the result can be a healthier world for us all. Thank you. <laughs>